Investigators in New Jersey and Pennsylvania have cracked a cold case that's been baffling them for nearly four decades. They say a skull found in Bucks County came from a Trenton man who was last seen alive on Christmas Eve in 1984. For years, detectives had struggled to crack cases where the victim was a John or Jane Doe, as there was simply no way to identify these victims other than hoping for a match within the missing person databases or a family member recognizing the victim. But with advancements in DNA technology, they now have a new tool at their disposal that is allowing them to crack cases that for years had stayed dormant. Victims who for decades had remained nameless and unidentified are finally getting their identities back, and families are finally receiving the closure they longed for regarding their missing loved ones. Hi friends, and welcome back to Mysterious Hook. Today we will be looking at two John Doe cases where the victims were finally identified in 2023. The victims in both of these cases were finally identified after decades using the revolutionary new DNA technology called genetic genealogy. But before we get into that, if you have a moment, please consider subscribing to the channel as it helps motivate us to keep creating new content for you regularly. Hit the notification bell to never miss another video. Now, without further ado, let's dive into these cases. Our first case today takes us to Bucks County in the state of Pennsylvania, the fourth most populous county in Pennsylvania with a population of over 640,000 people. Its county seat is the city of Doylestown. It has a total area of 622 square miles and is bounded by the Delaware River on its southeastern side. It was here, near the river, that a shocking discovery was made in 1986. June 15, 1986 was a quiet and seemingly peaceful Sunday morning in Buckingham Township in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. As it was the end of the weekend, most people spent their morning sleeping in after their late nights out on Saturday. Others looked to their hobbies for some solace, and a fisherman from Buckingham Township decided to spend his morning by the Delaware River doing what he loved best, fishing. He set out from home with his gear, ready to spend a relaxed day trying to get some good catches in the Delaware River. Nothing could have prepared him for what he was about to discover. Instead of fish, he was going to catch something else entirely on the banks of the river. He arrived at the river and was walking along the bank near the Mooresville boat ramp, looking for a good spot to establish himself, when he noticed something white sticking out of the shrubbery at the side of the riverbank. Curious, he went closer to see what it was and recoiled in shock when he realized it was a human skull. He looked around to see if there were any more bones or remains scattered near the skull, but could find nothing. Knowing he had to do something, he initially thought of calling the police, but since he did not know how long it would take them to get there, he took matters into his own hands and picked up the skull and took it to the Buckingham Township Police Department so they could investigate the matter. When the Buckingham Township Police Department received the skull, they were at a loss as how to investigate this matter. Due to the condition of the skull and the fact that no other remains were found other than the skull, there was little investigators could do to identify the unknown person or even attempt to describe any physical characteristics the person may have had. From examining the skull, they were able to determine that it belonged to someone white, but they could not determine the sex or the age of the victim, except that the victim had been less than 70 years old. Other than this, they had no other information about who this victim could have been, which made the investigation almost impossible to conduct as there was so little to work with. They tried to look through missing person cases at the time to see if any of them matched the scant information they had, but there was no way to determine if the skull belonged to any of the people they looked at. Eventually, with so little to work with, the investigation began to grow cold. Since only a skull was found, with no other remains, there was no burial held and the skull was stored away as evidence as it was the only clue available to investigators at a time. They hoped that in the years to come, with advances in science, the skull would be of use in the future. With no other leads to follow, the victim was classified as unknown and the case went cold. In October 2019, 33 years after the initial discovery of the skull near the Delaware River, during the probe of a homicide investigation, Bucks County detectives took possession of the skull, but eventually relinquished it to the Bucks County Coroner's Office. Later that year, the Coroner's Office entered the skull into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, NAMIS database, under the ID UP62362. They hoped that perhaps it would help jog the memory of someone who had been searching for their missing loved one 
all of these years. But unfortunately, no one came forward as the details surrounding the victim were still not very useful in helping someone identify them. All that was known now, even with the advancements in science since the initial discovery, was that the skull belonged to a man who had been under 70 years old and was white. Even though this information was put into NAMIS, eventually, the case went dormant again for another three years. Then, in September of 2022, 36 years after the initial discovery, Bucks County detectives went and retrieved the skull from the Bucks County coroner's office. Over the past few years, a number of cold cases from around the country had been solved through a revolutionary new DNA testing method called genetic genealogy. It used DNA testing and family trees to identify possible relatives to DNA profiles that had been unidentifiable for years. Bucks County detectives were hopeful that this amazing new technology would be useful in providing them with a breakthrough in this John Doe that they had been chasing for over three and a half decades. They had almost given up hope of ever solving this case due to how little information they had. But finally, after 36 years, they believed genetic genealogy might actually give them the chance. They sent the skull off to Othram, an organization based in Texas that specializes in forensic genealogy testing. Since forensic testing is an expensive process, the funds needed for testing the skull were contributed by AudioChuck, a podcasting platform that hosts a number of true crime podcasts. Once the funds were secured, through Audio Chunk's help and generosity, the forensic investigators at Othram got down to work. First, they developed a viable DNA extract from the skull, and then used a forensic-grade genome sequencing to develop a comprehensive DNA profile. Their in-house genealogy team then tested this profile against other profiles within their system to find if there were any matches within their databases that could lead them to relatives of the John Doe who were still alive in 2022. After a few short weeks of waiting for results, they were led to a 49-year-old woman residing in Florida whose DNA partially matched the profile they had developed from the skull. From the percentage of the match, Othram scientists believe that this woman could possibly be the daughter of John Doe, who had remained unidentified all these years. They provided these leads to the Bucks County detectives, who went to interview the woman on January 4, 2023, to see if her father had been missing for over three decades. The woman, whose name was not released to the public, revealed to the detectives that her father had in fact gone missing when she was only 11 years old. A subsequent test comparing the woman's full DNA results with the profile Othram had developed confirmed a parent-child relationship between their individual samples. Detectives had finally made a breakthrough in identifying the John Doe, and they learned that his name had been Richard Thomas Alt. Richard Thomas Alt was born in 1954 in the city of Trenton in the state of New Jersey. While not much is known about his early life, he spent all of it within Trenton itself, where both his parents doted on him dearly. He remained close to his parents as he grew into an adult, and since they lived in the same city, he would often spend time with them. Sometimes in his late 20s, he met a young secretary named Lori Sudom and was instantly smitten by her. The two of them quickly got into a relationship and were still together at the time when Richard went missing. The last recorded time of Richard being seen alive was on Christmas of 1984, when he visited his parents in a spirit of festive cheer. They had a wonderful time together, and when he left, his parents had no idea that this was the last time they would see their beloved son. Over the next few days, they began to grow increasingly concerned, as there was no form of contact from Richard, which was very unusual. They tried to call him, but got no response, and when they tried to call his girlfriend, Lori, to find out if she knew where he was, they could not get in touch with her as well. Finally, in January of 1985, they reported him missing to the police. A missing persons report was generated and a description of Richard was sent out to the public. In it, he was listed as 5'10 and weighing 140 pounds. He was a Caucasian man with medium to long strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. The description was put out to the public in hopes that someone who had seen Richard would come forward, but no one did. His girlfriend, Lori, who no one could find as well, was also reported missing at the time. Sadly, three months later on April 20th, 1985, two men who were fishing from a boat in the marina on the Delaware River in Trenton found the body of Lori Sudman floating on the water. When they called the authorities, they were able to identify her using fingerprint analysis as her prints were in the system 
as she had been previously arrested for a drug charge. Her death was never solved and remains an unsolved homicide even today. But at that time, police suspected that foul play was involved in both her death and the disappearance of Richard. Richard's skull was only discovered over a year later, but took over three decades to be identified, and the events surrounding both his and Lori's deaths remains a mystery even today. Once Richard was identified in 2023, Bucks County authorities closed their investigation into his death and disappearance due to lack of evidence of any crime being committed in Bucks County. The investigation into his and Lori's death is now being carried out by the Mercer County Police Department, under whose jurisdiction it falls. They have asked that if anyone has any information that might be useful to the investigation, they should come forward. In a statement to the press, Bucks County District Attorney Matthew D. Weintraub I can't even imagine wondering and worrying about a lost family member for even a day, let alone for 37 years. That wait is now over for Mr. Alt's family. I'm just glad that we could give them some peace of mind with this identification and the eventual return of his remains to his family. He also specifically thanked Othram, acknowledging that the case could never have been solved without their technical expertise. He hopes the genetic genealogy and the expertise of institutions like Othram will continue to provide breakthroughs in cases like this that have seemed hopeless for so many years. Our next case takes us to Loletta, a small town with a population of just over 800. Nestled in the heart of Northern California's Humboldt County, Loletta is surrounded by beautiful forests and rolling hills, providing a picturesque backdrop for outdoor activities such as hiking, fishing, and camping. But it was here in this idyllic setting that a gruesome discovery was made in 1998. On March 27, 1998, a Loletta resident and his son were on a boat sailing down the Eel River in search of driftwood. Something strange attracted their attention near Cock Robin Island as they were navigating through the river's bends and turns. They initially assumed it was just another piece of wood entangled in a nearby tree's branches, but as they got closer, they realized they were witnessing what appeared to be human remains. They were horrified at their discovery and rushed to inform the authorities at the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. The people of Loletta were shocked and dismayed as a result of this tragic day, which would never be forgotten and would always be a part of this small town's history. On hearing the news, the sheriff's deputies wasted no time in responding. They hurried by jet boat to the Eel River, unaware at the time that this case was going to stick with them for a very long time. They finally arrived at the location where the locals had reported the discovery. Their greatest fears were realized. The body of a man was found there, only partially clothed and in a stage of advanced decomposition. The deputies could make out that he was a white adult male, despite a state of decay. But other than that, they had no idea who he was or how he got into the river. The deputies were shocked at what they were seeing, and even the most seasoned were taken aback by the state the body was in. They removed the body from the water right away, meticulously going through the clothing, hoping that they would find some scrap of information that would have allowed them to identify the deceased. However, they were disappointed when they found that there was no form of identification and no personal possessions, basically nothing that could have assisted in identifying the victim. The body was taken from the scene and brought to the coroner's office for additional investigation. Although the results of the autopsy were disheartening, they provided the police with a place to start. The autopsy found that the individual had been in the water for a month before his discovery, and according to the coroner's report, the cause of death was that he had drowned. They were also able to find out some basic information about the man, including the fact that he was a white male adult, 5 foot 10 inches tall, about 170 pounds, and likely 35 to 45 years old. However, when they checked the database, this description did not match any reported missing persons from Northern California. Taking this into account, they began an investigation to find this unknown man's identity, and he was given the name of the Humboldt County John Doe. As they attempted to solve the riddle surrounding the man they had discovered in the river, detectives felt a sense of urgency. Before they could figure out what happened before his death, they understood they had to learn who he was. They were determined to learn who this individual had been because they were positive that someone out there was missing a loved one. The investigators put in a lot of effort and made the man's description public, hoping that it would jog someone's recollection of filing a missing persons report and lead to new information in the case. Days became weeks, yet despite all of their efforts, they had no results. 
but they remained hopeful that a single clue could help them crack the case wide open, and in this hope pursued every possible lead to the best of their ability. When the California Department of Justice discovered one latent fingerprint on the body later in 1998, there was finally some hope for the police. The automated latent print system was then used to analyze this. The detectives hoped that this could be a break in the case that they needed. However, their hopes were again dashed when the results came back and there was no matches in the system. Despite this setback, the investigations collected the man's DNA profile, which they then submitted into a number of databases, including the National Unidentified Persons DNA Index and the California Missing Persons DNA Database. Again, they searched the databases, looking for any indication of a match, but it turned up no results. As the years went by, the case remained open, as missing persons investigation cannot be closed. The DNA profile was routinely searched against profiles from both missing persons and other human remains in the combined index system coitus, but no profile matches were ever made. Over time, even though the investigation remained open, the case went cold. For 25 long years, the case lay dormant, with no new information or leads for the detectives to follow. In December 2022, the sheriff's office partnered with a forensic genealogy company called Othram, which is based in Texas. The partnership sought to identify the man through the application of innovative forensic DNA testing. A sample of the man's DNA was submitted to the lab, where the group of specialists started carefully and meticulously examining it. By utilizing forensic-grade genome sequencing, a cutting-edge method, they were able to create a comprehensive DNA profile of the man. After obtaining the profile, their genealogy team used forensic genetic genealogy to provide leads for investigations. This innovative approach combined DNA testing with traditional genealogical methods to create family profiles. By studying the genetic makeup of a DNA profile and comparing it within the many profiles already in the system, researchers can determine whether there are any biological relations of the profile they are testing for within the system and the percentage of the match. This was the method they used to identify the humble county John Doe. After months of agonizing anticipation, the authorities finally heard back from Othram with the results of the testing in middle of February 2023. According to the lab's analysis, it was very likely that the humble county John Doe was the relative of a woman named Cheryl, who was living in Missouri at the time. Othram believed that Cheryl was likely Humboldt County John Doe's sister. The detectives from the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office then reached out to Cheryl and learned that she did indeed have a brother who had been missing for many years, named Jeffrey Todd Sido. Cheryl was shocked to hear from detectives about her missing brother after all these years. When the detectives from the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office went out to Missouri to interview her, she told them that she had been searching for Jeffrey for many years and had almost given up hope on ever finding out what happened to him. Cheryl also told detectives that Jeffrey had been born in 1963 and would have been 35 when his body was found in 1998. However, she told them that the last contact she or anyone in the family had with him had been many years before that as they had not seen or heard from him since the mid-1990s. She told them that he had stopped communicating with her and all of the other members of their family for reasons that were unknown to all of them. She had tried reaching out to him but had never gotten a response. This is why they had never filled out a missing persons report about Jeffrey, as she and all of her family had thought his absence from their lives was an intentional choice that he had made. One would think that this information from Cheryl as well as the DNA testing from Othram would have been all the evidence that the police required to close the case, but they were determined to leave no stone unturned and confirm his identity once and for all. To do so, they obtained the fingerprints of Jeffrey and compared these to a latent fingerprint they had been able to lift off the body they found in the Eel River all those many years ago. All their hard work had paid off as the fingerprints came back as a perfect match. Finally, after 24 years, they knew for sure that Humboldt County John Doe was actually Jeffrey Todd Sido. Now that his identity has been confirmed, the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office is now working with his family members to make sure that his remains are returned to them so he can be buried along with his other deceased loved ones. After decades of not knowing where her brother was or what had happened to him, she thanked the detectives for their dedication to her brother's case and making sure that it was resolved after all these years.
The Humboldt County Sheriff's Office thanked the California Department of Justice DNA Lab and Othram for their outstanding work and assistance in solving this case and providing the Saido family some closure for their missing loved one. The Sheriff's Office still wants to know what happened to Jeffrey in his final days as they have urged anyone with information about his last known activities or whereabouts prior to his death to come forward and report it. And this is where we end it, folks. We hope you enjoyed the time with us today and learning about how genetic genealogy finally helped uncover the identities of these two John Does in 2023. We hope with these advancements in technology, more and more of these cases that have been dormant for years will be solved in the near future. But tell us, what did you think of these two cases? Did you think they would ever have been solved without genetic genealogy? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, smash that like button and subscribe so you never miss out on another. Until next time, stay safe and thanks for watching Mysterious Hook.